Do you have to have perfect vision to be a fighter pilot? No. Next question. It's story time. So if you remember a few episodes back, I showed you me flying with the Texas Air Aces, and that's what really sparked me wanting to become a fighter pilot. Now I definitely want to join the Air Force and Navy. 1998 into 1999, I was convinced I wanted to be a fighter pilot because I had flown these T-34s. Oh, we're not going to make it easy for me either. I had a father that was encouraging me, and the pilots that I had flown with had encouraged me to apply to the Air Force Academy. So in 1999, I was 16 years old and I started looking into the process of applying to the Air Force Academy uh, and joining the Air Force because I was like, you know, every, I, like everyone else, I thought to be a fighter pilot, you had to go to the Air Force Academy and then that's how you'd go to pilot training. Didn't know anything about guard reserve or anything like that. So in 1999, I started that process and started looking into the application process. I had talked to the senator uh, near me and was looking at an appointment. They said, yeah, we, we probably can give you an appointment. Your grades are good enough and stuff like that. But it was just the first step. At that time, I just so happened to have a routine vision exam at my local optometrist's office. And I'll never forget 16 year old me sitting in the dark room. The optometrist comes in and we're talking about it. And I'm like, yep, I want to be a fighter pilot. Uh, that's that's what I'm going to do. She was asking that. And she looked at me and she said, you're never going to be a fighter pilot. You'll be lucky to be a normal pilot. And you definitely won't be a commercial pilot either because your vision is just not good enough. You, we need to give you glasses. You've got astigmatism. And so I was like, oh, wow. OK, so I took these glasses home and I didn't like them. They made my head hurt. It didn't really work out well. But at that point, with my optometrist saying you're never going to be a fighter pilot because you don't have perfect vision. That was it for me. I decided uh, probably not going to do it and it's not going to happen because I didn't want to go to the Air Force if I couldn't fly. And so I turned off all of the process, the application process for going to the Air Force Academy and all that stuff and decided, you know, I'm not going to do this. Never wore the glasses, mind you. In fact, my dad had told me, you know, when he was a kid, he had been given glasses and eventually his vision improved and he didn't need them anymore. And so I didn't like them, so I didn't wear them. And I went to college, and during that time, my dad's like, well, hey, why don't you try Guard Reserve? And I'll tell this story later in detail on how I got a pilot slot through the Guard Reserve. But I kind of forgot about that whole incident about, you know, my optometrist telling me I, I couldn't be a, a fighter pilot. And I was kind of in this, make them tell you no. You know, I'll just apply and keep pushing forward, and eventually somebody will say, yep, you're right, you know, your vision's too bad or whatever. And I just it was like, I'm not wearing glasses, I'm fine. And I just got my pilot's license and I could read the, the charts and 2020 and all that stuff. So I thought I'm good to go. So I go and get, uh, I find out about the Air Force Reserve and get a pilot slot that way. So off the street, I'm going to fly A-10s at the time. They hire me and uh, first step is to go to MEPS. And I go to MEPS and... Uh, which is the military entrance processing station uh, there in New Orleans, and get to the vision 2020. You know, I can read the 2020 line, no problem. But we get to the depth perception part, which is the series of circles. And no one had briefed me on the circles uh, or the tricks to that. No one had told me I'd, the first time I'd ever seen these circles. And I, I couldn't pass. I could not pass the little circles like the depth perception part. So they kicked me out and said, you know, you're good for everything else except for this. Uh, you can retake it later, you know, if you go to a local clinic and, and can prove that you can pass. So luckily for me, because I was working in a fighter squadron and I had friends that wanted to help me out, uh, they took me to the local base clinic and sat me down and said, hey, let's take a look at this. Let's practice a little bit before you go take it again. And one thing they told me that helped me the most was that for those stupid circles, it's never the ones on the outside. It's always one of the middle ones. So uh, that helped. I was able to pass. I thought, man, good to go. Uh, that scare is over. I'm going to go fly A-10s, go be a fighter pilot. So the next step in the process was for them to send me to, at the time, Brook City Base uh, in San Antonio, which is where the Air Force Aeromedical uh, Center was. Later on, it would move to Wright-Patton. I think that's where it is today. And 
I was a little nervous because I had just failed the depth perception, had retaken it and passed. And now it was, hey, I just need to get through this. So I go to Brooks and it's a battery of tests. They do IQ tests, they physical, heart, all that stuff. And on the first day, the actual the thing that caught me off guard the most was that like they did the EKG and they're like, hey, you got this little murmur. Uh, it's no big deal. But if anybody ever asks you about it, you know, it's that's that's not a thing. You know, it's just we, we see it. We know about it. We think you're fine, but it may may be an issue if somebody's not paying attention when they do an EKG on you, which would come up later when I got struck by lightning. Um, so we get through that and then on to the vision and the vision. Oh, boy. So they send you through all the different tests and stuff and the little machines uh, to check your near far uh, color vision, depth perception, all that stuff. And I was worried about doing the depth perception again, but. I got through it and I was actually 2012, 2015 uh, vision. So I'm like, man, you know, I'm I'm going to pass this with flying colors. But then they do this thing called uh, a retinal topography and they come back. They sit me down uh, because it was me and like maybe two other people. They separated me from the group and they said, hey, uh, you're not passing. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not passing? You've got excessive astigmatism beyond the uh beyond the limits so there's a certain diopter limit i think it was three at the time and you're just outside of that um so we can't uh pass you at this point and so what we can do is potentially put you in a waiver program um and a study program to see you know how this works with trained aviators and stuff and we'll recommend you for a waiver and we'll see how it goes i'm like so when will i know and he's like i mean it'll be weeks so they they finished all the tests and stuff. They actually put me through some special uh, testing, uh, NVG stuff, just to see how I do with without glasses, all that stuff. And at the time, the vision standards, I think, were 2040 correctable to 2020. Uh, I don't think it, it changed uh, yet. So I go home and I go back to the unit and the unit's like, so what happened? I'm like, well, you know, I didn't pass the vision, passed everything else, didn't pass the vision. So they're going to recommend me for a waiver you know can you follow up and so the guys went to bat for me you know they were calling you know saying hey is is he gonna go is he gonna pass he's gonna get a a flying class one medical any of that stuff and it took about six to nine weeks and eventually they came back with here's your waiver and i went off to pilot training and eventually the waiver became permanent uh, because i never needed glasses i could always pass the uh, the test, they said, well, you're passing because you're squinting a little bit, but I'm like, well, I mean, they gave me glasses. I never liked wearing them. And so I never ended up, uh, wearing them. Eventually the waiver expired, uh, or became indefinite. Uh, and then that was the end of that, which was funny when I came back to the air force, they're like, indefinite does not mean permanent, which I'm not sure how that works. So I had to reapply for the same waiver that I'd already anyway, whatever. So long story short, I became, I overcame the vision thing because I kept pushing. Like I didn't just, at the moment when the optometrist said, you know, that's the end of that, I was just kind of fat, dumb and happy about it. You know, I was like, well, okay, I'll just let them tell me no later and I won't, I'll I'll just keep applying until they they say no. And eventually the answer was yes. And uh, I never got to talk to that optometrist again, but not only did I fly fighters in the Air Force, but I flew them in the Navy. I uh, flew airliners, uh, flown civilian uh, helicopters, all, all this stuff. Like I've had a great career and I've been very fortunate. But the reason I was able to do that is because I didn't take no for an answer. So when I see people today say, you know, hey, you got to have perfect vision. And I've talked about this on other videos and this is kind of a dead horse, but I want to keep foot stomping it because I think people still today are relying on this myth. So I wanted to take a look at the actual, no kidding, here are the standards. And if you go to the, uh, it's called the U.S. Air Force Medical Standards. Uh, It's 1 February 2022 uh, Medical Standards Directory. I'll leave a link in the description. And it tells you what is required to become a fighter pilot and what, what standards you have to have. So You know, if you're looking at FC1, FC1A, those are people that are going to be students. So that's the initial. So to get in, you have to have a flying class one. And then once you're in, you have to have a flying class two. So there is no uncorrected standard anymore. So it used to be uncorrected 2040, corrected to 2020. uh, Then it went to 2080. Now there is no standard. So 
it basically means that you have to be corrected to 2020. So with something, glasses, contacts, LASIK, something, uh, to get to the 2020 standard, near and far. And then in any meridian, you're plus two to minus three, and then plus three to minus, plus three and a half to minus four once you're actually a pilot. Your astigmatism limit is three. Uh, and then you can see there the other, uh, the other standards. It says, note one, trained individuals found a routine examination to be 2020 in one eye and 2025 with corrective lenses, but are corrected, correctable to 2020, have normal stereopsis, may continue flying until the appropriate corrective lenses arrive. These lenses must be ordered by the most expeditious means. So there are a lot of notes. You can read that through there. The Navy is the same way. I believe it is uh, 2040 corrected to 2020. Um, I might be different. Don't quote me on the Navy. I haven't looked at the Navy standards uh, recently, but it is a myth that you have to have perfect or better vision to be a fire pilot. And I'm the prime example of that because I had a excessive astigmatism and I just said, OK, well, I'm going to keep pushing. And eventually it worked out for me. And this is not specific to Air Force Reserve, Air National Guard, uh, active duty, uh, reserves any Air Force aircraft that you're going to fly to get this flying class two or flying class one. These are the standards. So it uh, doesn't matter how you commission, doesn't matter how you end up getting to pilot training. It's still the same. So that's what that's that story, because uh, I mentioned it previously. Uh, I'll talk about some other hurdles that I had to overcome on the journey. You know, this, maybe we'll make this a series, but this is kind of the biggest myth and this was kind of the biggest letdown for me at least was you know oh i can't be a fighter pilot and then just did it anyway and that's what you have to do you just do it anyway make them tell you no and eventually you know you'll either have exhausted all of the options and realize that you know it wasn't for me but at least i tried or you'll find that the answer is yes and things will go well so Leave the link in the description. You can also go to make them tell you know.com, which is a website I made just with a frequently asked questions. We've also got the make them tell you know Facebook group if you want to ask questions. Or you can send me an email, uh, either move or mailbag at cwmoin.com or cwmoin.com, and I'll try to help you find the answer. I'm not promising anything, but realize this is all unofficial, doesn't represent anything from the DOD or anything like that. This is just me as a civilian uh, trying to help out to give back to. You know how I was fortunate enough to have people help me. I'm just trying to pay it forward. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope this helps. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.